Okay, hi everybody. Today in this video, we are going to mostly look at this new tool called a master method that will allow us to solve recurrences more easily. And then we're going to look at one more um, divide and conquer algorithm example uh, related to multiplication to kind of end off this unit with the bang. Um, so for the first goal, this is a whole bunch of recurrences that we've seen so far. And of course, all of these, you know, when we write something like this, what we really mean is like t of n is 1 when n is less than, you know, some constant amount. And otherwise, it's like that value, you know, whatever is, is down here. So really, this is the part that matters, is the recursive part of the recurrence. And so let's focus on that and see what we've come up with so far. Um, so we've seen all these different things that have some slightly different form. But notice what's in common. We have like a recursive part and we have a extra computation. So, and then the recursive part is really how many recursive calls do you have? So we have like two, three, and four here listed or one. And then what does it look like? So far, everything we've seen is either n divided by two or n minus one. And then we've seen all these different running times that come out of it. Uh, sometimes it's the same running time, even though it's a very different looking recurrence. And so now we can think about um, how to start to generalize these. And we've been recognizing patterns already, but there is actually a general rule um, for all of these kinds of recurrences, and it's called a master method. So here's here it is. Uh, this is what, if you see people talking about the master method for solving recurrences, usually it's it's this one that they're talking about, um, although there's a second form that I'll talk about in a second as well. So what is this? This is um, what, we, what we're doing is we're saying here's a general form of the recurrence. So A, B, C, and D are constants. Maybe 0. You know, maybe C and D will be 0. And then what you do is you say, if I can write my recurrence like this, then I can um, just check this one value, which is log base b of a, and compare that to the exponent of n, then that tells you what the big theta is of that recurrence. So the master method is instead of like doing the manual expansion and trying to solve recurrences that way, you instead take whatever formula you're given and try to put it into this form, which basically means figuring out what are the A, B, C, and D constants for your recurrence, then kind of plug it in and see what comes out. Um, so I want to look at two things. I want to, first of all, get some intuition of why, like what's going on here and, and why are there these three categories of C and D and, and what does that actually mean? And then look at a couple of examples of um, how you would actually use this. So I'm not going to uh, actually f completely prove this. And the reason why is because I don't actually think that you seeing a proof of this is as valuable as you if you are interested um, and kind of motivated, then I encourage you to try to prove this. Maybe like take off this log into the D part it might make it a little bit easier to, to prove. Um, so I think that the exercise of thinking about how you prove this yourself is useful. I don't think that the exercise of seeing me prove this is that instructive for you. Um, but I'm, of course, happy to talk about it in the eye. And you can look in online or either of the two textbooks, one of which is available online, um, to see like complete proofs of, of this master method. So, but let's get some intuition for what's happening. So here's the general, it's for a recurrence where we're dividing n divided by b every time. So let's think about what this looks like and how it would be expanded out a little bit. And that'll give some intuition about like why there's three cases and what's going on. So here we have t of n is, and I'm just rewriting in a different order, um, is n to the c times log to the d n plus um, a times t of n over b. Okay, so that's what we have. Now let's think about expanding this out. Okay. 
Okay, so what's happening here is we have everything here is like n to the c times log to the d of whatever. Um, and then it's multiplied by higher and higher powers of a over b to the c. So it's really, we can see it's n to the c times um, log dn plus a over b to the c log d n over b plus a over b to the c squared log d n over b squared. So that keeps going. Um, and then this last term is always going to be a to the i t of n over b to the i. So this is kind of what's happening. And if you if you ignore the log, the log d for the moment, if we kind of cut those out, then what you can see is that this is really just a geometric series. So it's really a geometric series times logs. Um, and this one is something that we've seen a number of times now uh, that is going to tell us how long the, re the recursion needs to go down. So because it's dividing n divided by b to the i every time, that tells us that the number of steps until this hits the base case is going to be log base b of n. So what this last term here is going to become will be log base b of n, so a to the log base b of n, which equals, and remember there's a trick of logs where you can um, switch the base and the log, the, the target of the log and the exponent, so we can switch the n and the a and we don't change this value, so this is the same as n to the log base b of a. So that's what this last term is going to become. What about this whole business here? Well, um, we're going to have n to the c times something. And what's inside the parentheses is a geometric series. So geometric series um, times logs. So that's the most complicated part of the analysis. And I'm not going to go through the, the full details, but just to say that there's really three cases. So one case is where we have the largest values over here on the left hand side. Um, so basically, if a over b to the c is less than 1, then this is shrinking. So we can say like, if this term is the biggest one, that's kind of like what I would call a top heavy. And it's going to happen when a over b to the c is less than 1. That's one option. Uh, another extreme with the geometric series is that everything is kind of skewed to the right. So this is like a bottom heavy recursion, and it's exactly the opposite situation. It's where each of these terms will be growing and growing, so where a over b to the c is bigger than 1. If a over b to the c is bigger than 1. And then there's one more option, and that's what, what I would call the balanced option. So that's where... Uh, all of these are ro roughly the same except for the log parts. And what does that mean is that a over b to the c is equal to 1. So it means that these terms aren't really shrinking or growing. Um, so that's what I would call the balanced case. And that's when a over b to the c is equal to 1. And so those three cases are actually exactly the three cases of the, um, of the thing here. So e is log base b of a. So if you flip this around, um, you can see that this comparing a over b to the c to 1 is the same as comparing log base b of a to c. Uh, and so that's exactly what we have here. This c equals e. This is the balanced case. Um, and the c being less than e, what does that mean is that the this part of the recurrence doesn't have as much effect as how much the number of recursive calls is growing. So this is what's called a bottom heavy case, where the real cost of the algorithm comes from the, the low levels of the recursive calls. It comes from the fact that you have a lot of recursive calls, not from the cost of each one. So that's like a, what I would call a bottom heavy recurrence. And it has to do, again, mathematically, it has to do with when the end of this geometric series really dominates the whole thing. 
And this third case right here is a top-heavy case. And that's where the very top level of the recursion, because you're working on the largest size, that dominates the whole thing. And we've seen all three of these instances so far. Um, so let me look at some examples and then see how we actually would apply this master method in practice. Here's an example. Um, if I have like the merge sort recurrence, um, one if n is less than or equal to one, and otherwise it's uh, n plus two t of n over two. How do we apply this? You know that the answer is going to be big theta of n log n, but let's see how we actually use the master method. Um, so the first thing we want to do is recognize what are the values of these constants a, b, c, and d in this uh, equation. So a is how many recursive calls, b is how small do they each get, and then c and d are the exponents of n and log n. The one, one aspect that can be tricky is remember that these can be zero. So for example, if this isn't present at all, if there's no log at all, um, if that's not present, what does that really mean is that the exponent is zero, right? Because log n to the zero is just one. So that's the same thing um, as it not being there. Means d equals zero. And in many cases, d will be equal to zero. Um, and so that's actually what we have here. So here we have what's the power of n is one. So that's the power of n. Um, d is zero here. That's the power of log n. There's no log n in this recurrence, so d is 0. a is 2. That's the number of recursive calls. And um, b is also equal to 2. That's the uh, shrinking factor in each recursive call. And so now we need to compute e, which is log base b of a. Uh, in this case, it's easy to compute that. It's log base 2 of 2, which is 1. And so now we need to check what, how to c compare to e, c versus e. And in this case, we can see that c is equal to e. And so that means that we have a balanced case. And so we can look up the formula from the previous slide. And basically what the balanced case means that you have an extra log factor. So it's like whatever this is times another log n. And again, that makes sense because if you think about what that means, the balanced case means that like all of these kind of contribute equally. And so it's the number of terms here is exactly um, log of n. So what we get out of this in total is big theta of n. So the cost at the top level times an extra log n. And you know that n log n is the cost of uh, merge sort, so that's great. And so I hope that this example was uh, illustrative of the power of the master method, but also how it can be a little bit annoying, right? You have to figure out what these constants are um, and then kind of figure out which case you're in and then plug into that formula. So the advantage is that you don't have to do this full expansion and like figure out the cost of series or anything like that. The disadvantage is you have to be really careful about how does this particular you know, example that I'm looking at right now, how does that fit into this general formula? And um, so for a very simple one like n plus 2t of n over 2, you can still say like, oh, this is the same as merge sort and then just write big theta of n log n. The advantage is when we see something which doesn't fit into exactly one of the previous examples we've seen, but if it fits into this more general formulation, then we can still apply this master method, and that's a, a really useful thing to be able to do. Okay, this is another master method here, uh, what I'm calling master method B. It's not as common to see as the first one, and it's also um, much easier to apply. So this is, if the first one was kind of for divide and conquer recurrences, this is for like subtract and conquer type problems. So any problem where you're subtracting a constant amount every time from the in original input size, you can use this kind of thing. So again, we have the extra work over here and we have the recursive part 
right here. And when you're given a recurrence that you're trying to solve, your first task is to figure out what are these variables. It's almost exactly the same form as master method A. The difference is that instead of n divided by b here, we have n minus b. And then it turns out that that simplifies things quite, quite a bit. So if the number of recursive calls is one, so if this is just like t of n minus one, then we're gonna have polynomial time. And what you should notice is that this plus one. So this means like the top level cost um, times n. So basically what that's saying is that if you have a subtract and conquer thing with only one recursive call, then it's just the top level cost times an extra n. And if if there's more than one recursive call, like we saw this in the, I think like the bad version of the uh, max algorithm we saw as a puzzle a couple weeks ago, then what you have is exponential time. Um, and the actual base of the exponential time is a to the one over b that you can calculate. But the main thing is to know that this is exponential time. Um, and usually that's enough to kind of scare you away, but sometimes we need to know to actually analyze what is that exponential running time. And so you can think about like, if we look back to this list, um, like the linear search problem is an example of a subtract and conquer where at one plus T of N minus one. So if you plug everything in, you'll see that, okay, this is just doing one recursive call. It's a subtract and conquer type recurrence. So that means I take the top level cost times an extra N. And so the overall asymptotic cost of this should be big theta of one times n, which is big theta of n, and, and indeed that's what we get. In this case for selection sort, it's n times n, because the top level cost is n, and that's why selection sort is n squared. Okay, so we have these two master methods. Again, it takes a little bit of care to apply them, but now we can use these to solve much more complicated recurrences without having to kind of do the full series expansion ourselves. And so let's look at one more example of a problem now um, where we can see another divide and conquer algorithm and where it's going to be a good case of actually using that um, first master method. Um, so we're not going to dwell on this too much, but it's something that I think you might be familiar with from previous classes. And um, actually, we're going to hit on matrix multiplication a little bit more in the next unit as well as a tool for something else. And so it's important to remember how this problem works. So here's an example. These are both matrices. So A is a four by three matrix because it has four rows and three columns. And B is a three by two matrix. So this is a typo here. B should be a three by two matrix um, because it has three rows and two columns. And so what we get out of it is AB is a four row and two column matrix. So it's the inner dimensions have to match. So like three and three have to match here. And the resulting output is based on the outer dimension. So this is a four by two matrix. Okay, now what's the cost of doing this? Well, what you have to do to get the result like 56 is you multiply. So this is the second row and the first column which means you multiply, do a dot product of the second row here and the first column here. And so if you do that, like six times two plus two times six, that's 12 plus 12 is 24, plus eight times four is uh, 12 plus 12 plus 32, and the total is 56. And so each one of the entries in the product is a dot product of one row from A and one column from B. And so what's the total cost of that? It's I have to do four times two um, entries in the product and each of them costs three steps. So it's actually the product of the two outer dimensions and the one inner dimension. Um, so it's the product of the three um, different dimensions. And in general, if we have if we have both of them of being like square, like n by n matrices, then what's the total cost going to be is I have to do n squared dot products, and each one of those dot products costs n. So that would be big theta of like n cubed. Okay, so that's the standard algorithm for multiplication, basically costs cubic time in order to, to multiply everything. 
um, that makes sense. And this was, uh, just like with some other things we've seen, this was believed to be the optimal for a long time. So we're going to assume that both matrices are square. And so what you do is you split up the matrices. It's not like with um, arrays where you can just split in half means one side and the other side. When you split up a matrix, you have to split it into like four quadrants because it's really like a two dimensional thing. So what each of these ways of splitting is like taking the first n over two rows and the last n over two rows and the first n over two columns and the last n over two columns. So you get and your n by n matrix becomes four n over two by n over two matrices. And so you do that for both input matrices and I'll just give them these names. And it turns out that you can um, figure out what the output should be based on exactly, so treating each of these like S, T, U, V are each a block of the original matrix. And the question is, what's the running time of this formulation? So if we just kind of write this out, then you see that we have to do eight different multiplications of n over 2 by n over 2 matrices and then some extra additions. So we would get t of n is um, like one single multiplication in the base case when n equals 1. And otherwise, it's going to be n amount of extra work because we have to kind of add and subtract. We'll just add these at the end. So it's like n amount of extra, n, sorry, n squared amount of extra work because these are each, uh, the total size of this is n squared. Plus, we have eight recursive calls, each of size n over 2, dimension n over 2. And so now we have a divide and conquer recurrence. We have not seen exactly this one before, but we can apply our master method. So for the master method, the first thing we want to think about is what's e, which is log base b of a, and that's going to be log base 2 of 8 which uh, eight is two cubed, so this is just three. Then we say, how does that compare to the exponent of n? Three is bigger, so three is bigger than two, so that means that this is bottom heavy, which means that the total cost is big theta of n to the e, so big theta of n cubed. Now, what does that mean? It's really the same thing that we saw of the first divide and conquer algorithm for polynomial multiplication, where we did this work to split it up. It seems cool. We have some more complicated recurrence, but then we get the same running time as kind of the standard algorithm to do the same thing. And then just like with Karatsuba's algorithm, but this one was invented in the following decade after Karatsuba and was, I think, a lot more difficult to come up with, we actually have a way of doing it a little bit better. So this is what's called Strassen's algorithm, um, named after this guy, uh, Volker Strassen, who's uh, famous for a number of important com computations. Actually, he also invented an early primality test called solovey strassen um, And uh, I've had a chance to meet Volker Strassen a couple of times. He's retired now, but he's a very uh, sweet, uh, nice guy, totally brilliant. And um, it's a little bit mysterious how he came up with this algorithm. So he came up with, uh, this is called Strassen's algorithm, that you only do seven products. So instead of doing eight products, you do seven products, but you have to like add and subtract the original submatrices in these crazy ways. And then it turns out that you can combine them like this to, and to get the answer. Um, so you shouldn't take my word necessarily that, that, that this works, but you can check any part of it. So like P3 plus P4 that if we expand this out, P3 is UW plus VW, P4 is um, going to be VY, and then minus VW. So the VWs cancel out, and you have UW plus VY. And if you check back, that's exactly what's supposed to be down there, UW plus VY. And you can do a similar check for all four of these quadrants, and you see that, like, it all checks out and it all works. So what's the running time of this? Well, we're gonna have basically uh, n squared extra work. So it's more additions and subtractions, but it's still just n squared amount of time um, because all the matrices that we're dealing with are, are at most n by n, um, plus seven times t of n over two. 
And so what you should notice is that all that really changed from here is that instead of doing eight recursive calls, now we have seven. So that means that this E value is log base two of seven now, which is, um, I mean, that's not a whole number, but it's like 2.89, I think. And uh, that's less than three. So this is still a bottom heavy recurrence, but we have big theta of n to the um, log base two of seven, which is a slight improvement over n cubed. And it turns out that this was a big deal. Nobody thought that it was possible. Everybody kind of believed that n cubes might be intrinsically the amount of work you have to do for matrix multiplication. And, um, and so this is a, Th that that's where this has come out as. Um, I will not ask you to actually run Strassen's algorithm. Um, so you don't have to memorize or even write down what this formulation is. But you should know that it has this running time, n to the log base 2 of 7, which is a little bit better than n cubed, and was the first algorithm along this line of work. Um, and if you look up uh, matrix multiplication progress, you'll see that there's been a lot of uh, research progress in this direction since Strassen came up with this algorithm in the 60s. What's the best asymptotic running time of matrix multiplication? No one actually knows what the answer is. Nobody knows if it can be as small as like n log n, or sorry, I should say n squared log n, or whether it maybe can be n squared, or maybe really n to the 2.3 something is like the best possible. Nobody knows. Um, and so it's an area of uh, active research um, that has important implications because matrix multiplication is now really the basis of a lot of those um, machine learning algorithms like neural nets and things that you might have heard about. Uh, so people want to do this as fast as possible. Strassen's algorithm is used in practice and a few other ones are used in practice as well of some other improvements, but mostly a lot of the improvements in the last few decades are not used in practice because they don't like kind of have any advantage until the size is so huge that um, as to be impractical for us to actually do the computation anyway. So that's it for this unit. Um, what this unit has really been all about is divide and conquer. And then we also saw these master methods, um, which are very useful when we get into more complicated kinds of recurrences. So notice that we just introduced like these two different divide and conquer matrix multiplication algorithms. And we did not have to spend a lot of time of like expanding this all out and figuring out that recurrence and then figuring out this recurrence because we now have this tool of a master method which allows us to kind of just plug in and quickly say um, what the running time is for a recursive algorithm. And I hope that this was an interesting exploration of some numerical algorithms and and also a little bit of an insight into what are the limitations and the state of our current research. And now you have these new tools, new ways to think about divide and conquer, new ways to analyze divide and conquer that you can use for your own problems that you come up with.